Let's now sing five, no, no, okay, let's, let's go to the Psalter hymnal, and instead of doing the um, one that your pastor selected from the catechism, I selected something else, and can you please turn to page 891 at the back of the, the Psalter hymnal in, in the catechism. And we're going to do s number 104. I will ask the question. Let's all of us respond with the answer. So 104, what is God's will for you in the fifth commandment? That I show honor, love, and faithfulness to my father and mother and all those in authority over me. Submit myself with proper obedience to all their good teaching and discipline, and also that I be patient with their failings, for by their hand God wills to rule us. And I want to emphasize that it's not just parents, but all those in authority over me. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. And then in Scripture, let's start off with Exodus. Exodus 2, the first 10 verses. We've been going through the heroes of faith as we find them listed in Hebrews 11. And we can't look at the, what is said in Hebrews without also reading from Exodus 2. So Exodus 2, the first 10 verses. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. What a wonderful story, and the irony of God. The baby was supposed to be killed, and instead the mother was paid to look after him. Wow. Just isn't that amazing? So, our text is from Hebrews 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you and our request is that you will speak so that we can receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord. Amen.
That, by the way, is the words of 172 in the Psalter hymnal. I believe this is the ninth message, congregation, on the heroes of faith. And so far, I have not been surprised by any of the heroes that have been listed. And I suspect the original audience of Hebrews is exactly the same as me, not surprised. Not surprised about Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. But today surprises me. Our text says, first of all, Moses. So you think, okay, Moses is going to be the hero of faith mentioned. Nope. It's not Moses. It's Moses' parents. And I suspect that should surprise all of you and does. And you don't have to answer out loud, but... To illustrate how surprising that is, how many of you know the names of Moses' parents? Anyone nodding yes? Other than no one? Okay, I proved my point. We are not given the names until four chapters after Moses' birth. And yet Hebrews chooses to use them as heroes of faith. Their names, by the way, Amram, that's the guy, and Jochebed, that's the mother, Amram and Jochebed. Now let me remind you, faith is our response to God's revelation. Biblical faith, righteous faith, that's a response to the Word of God. So what we want to ask and answer this morning is how did Moses' parents respond to the Word of God? How did Amram and Jacobit respond to God's revelation? Now in our first point, we need to look at the setting. The last time we looked at Hebrews, we saw that the children of Israel, all 70 of them, had settled in Egypt, more specifically in the best part of Egypt, at least for their flocks and herds and crops, what we know is Goshen. And in Goshen, the people, they thrived, they prospered, they increased, so that by the time of the Exodus, the 70 had grown to over 2 million people. And scripture tells us in the Old Testament that the Egyptians feared the number of Israelites. They worried that if there ever was a war, and there was always war back then, that the Israelites would join with Egypt or Egypt's enemies, fight against them, and leave the country. Now, a little bit of a confession that I need to make. I guess it's not really a confession. An explanation would be better. When I preach on the stories of the Old Testament, the stories that we find in Genesis and so on, I often look at Josephus. Josephus is a Jewish historian. Now, what he writes is not inspired, not even close. Sometimes it's a little fanciful, and he tended also to favor the Romans in his explanation of a lot of things, because that's when he wrote at the time of the Jesus and the Romans. But he does give us an insight into how the Israelites themselves understood the Bible books and the Bible stories. And he gives us a listing, too, of the stories the oral traditions that were passed on from Adam to Cain and Abel and Seth and all the way down through the course of history. And he wrote that down. 
Now Josephus tells us the Egyptians became jealous of how the Israelites prospered and flourished. And the Egyptians, according to Josephus, believed that it was done at their expense. And so Josephus, in recounting the history, the oral traditions, tells us that a new pharaoh came to the throne and he did not know about Joseph and greatly feared the Israelites. And we all know what happened next. <clears throat> we need to control the Israelites. And there were four different plans that were put into action. Plan one, slave masters were put over the Israelites. And remember, their workload was increased, their supplies were decreased, and they were whipped and beaten. And the plan it backfired. It backfired. Because though the Israelites were more oppressed than ever, they prospered, they multiplied, they spread. And the Egyptians became even more scared. Plan two. Well, let's kill any of the baby boys at the time of birth. And the Hebrew midwives were commanded to kill them if they were a boy. But they feared God, says scripture in the Old Testament. They didn't kill them. They gave an actual lie to Pharaoh. Yeah, the Hebrew women, they give birth in such a hurry that the babies are all born before we even get there. Okay. And the net result, the people continue to increase and become even more numerous. I said four plans, actually three. Here's plan three. Forget the Israelites doing something. Forget the midwives doing something. I'm going to put my soldiers in charge. Go through all Goshen and find the Hebrew boys, the infant boys, and kill them. Throw them in the River Nile. Let them be crocodile food. And so they did a house-to-house -house search for every Hebrew baby. And you know, they took note of the pregnant women and marked it down to do a visit later and grab the baby that was to be born, especially if it was a boy. Now, why did Pharaoh pick just on the boys and why were the girls left alone? Josephus gives us an answer, and I don't know whether it's accurate or not. It's not part of the Bible. But Josephus tells us an Egyptian scribe foretold the birth of a baby boy to the Israelites who would, here's the quote, bring the Egyptian dominion low and raise up the Israelites, that he would excel all men in virtue and obtain a glory that would be remembered throughout all the ages. That's Moses. An Egyptian scribe supposedly given a revelation about Moses. And as we all know, and as we just read this morning from Exodus, God and his providence, God using irony, had Pharaoh's own daughter rescue Moses, pay for his own mother, Moses' own mother, to look after him, adopt him as her own, and take him into her house. We discover again that the wickedness of men can never frustrate the plans of God. I mentioned last time, or was it the time before? I think it was last time, about the fivefold promise God had given to Abraham. Remember those promises? First, Israel is going to be in Egypt. And remember, they went there because there was no food in the land and Egypt had lots of food. So God was going to use Egypt to feed his people. And secondly, Israel is going to be mistreated for 400 years. Thirdly, God was going to punish Egypt. And fourthly, Israel was going to come out of Egypt with great possessions. 
And fifthly, the people of Israel will end up back in the land of Canaan. And no matter what Pharaoh does or tries to do, this plan of God cannot be thwarted, cannot be changed, and will be realized and fulfilled. And to bring this plan to fruition, God used a couple, the parents of Moses, Amram and Jochebed. Now that brings us to point two. I had us read together this morning from the Catechism about honoring mom and dad. And the Catechism wisely extends this to all those in authority. We are to obey the governing authorities. But now a problem. What happens when the decrees of God run counter to the decrees of man. Now we had a little bit of a taste of that not that long ago, remember? COVID and you people here in Fresno had it way, 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 way worse than us in Tulare County. I'm not sure if the governing authorities in Tulare County fear God or feared man, but obviously the ones here did neither. And we have a dilemma too many times. Like we had a COVID, do we fear God or do we fear man? And when Christians are put into this kind of a situation, we always choose to obey God rather than man. And we see that throughout the Bible. Think of Daniel's three friends. Nebuchadnezzar, remember what he did? He made a statue, and everyone is to worship and pray before that statue. They are to bend the knee and bow down and worship. And so everyone did that, but three remained standing, Daniel's friends. Nope, we're not going to do that. Even if you throw us in the fiery furnace, we're not going to do that. And then Daniel Okay, everyone in the kingdom is supposed to pray to me, the king, King Darius. And that was a plot, of course, by Daniel's enemies because they knew that Daniel went to the window facing Jerusalem and three times a day, and I'm sure more times when there was times of stress, he would kneel at that window looking towards Jerusalem and the temple and pray to the Lord God Almighty. And the result, he was thrown in the lion's den. And Peter and John called before the Sanhedrin. We're sick and tired of you guys preaching about this Christ man, this Christ character. Stop. They got thrown into prison. They were released by an angel. And they were found in the courtyard of the temple. Guess what they were doing? They were preaching about Christ. Dragged before the Sanhedrin again. We choose to obey God rather than man. Now the decree of Pharaoh was clear. Moses was, was supposed to be crocodile food. And Amram and Jochebed had to make a choice when Moses was born. Would they obey the authority of heaven or would they obey the authority of earth? By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents. By faith, Amram and Jochebed chose to disobey Pharaoh. And theirs was a deliberate, willful, disobedient act to the established earthly authority. And Josephus tells us the punishment of they were going to be caught. Every member of the family would be put to death. The parents, Miriam, Aaron, their parents, if they were still alive, even brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, the whole family would be put to death. And yet, this godly couple 
Amran and Jochebed, chose to obey God rather than man. Now let me emphasize what Scripture tells us. What Moses' parents did was what? An act of faith. We might say, well, it was done out of parental love. Well, that's not the first reason. We might say, well, it's normal for normal fathers and mothers to act that way to protect their children. That's not the first reason. By faith, they hid Moses for three months. Now, our text adds something that we usually look over. And as I was studying and reflecting on this this past week, I was surprised again. Our text tells us Moses' parents saw that their child was, did you catch that? Beautiful. Okay, not that long ago, I remember saying that about my grandkids. I think every grandparent does that. Oh, yeah, we got the smartest kid in the world, the smartest, the best looking, the most athletic. And parents do that, too, maybe not as bad as grandparents. But that's not what the case is here, and that's not actually a good translation of the word by the ESV, the English Standard Standard Version. It means that, I guess maybe we should ask, well, who is it that said that Moses was beautiful? Well, his parents said, but because there's an underlying reason, it's because God said so. And how is someone beautiful in God's eyes? Well, God does not look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Moses was beautiful in the eyes of God, approved, accepted, pleasing, because he had been chosen from eternity according to God's plan to have a role in the salvation of and redemption of God's people. Now let's go back a moment to what faith is. Remember, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, is that phrase used over and over again in Hebrews. Faith is a response to God's revelation. So somehow, in some form, some way, Moses' parents were given a revelation about Moses and his role that God had determined for the plan of salvation and redemption. And by faith, they responded to this revelation. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us much. We're left with lots of unanswered questions. We do know that Amran and Jacobid were aware of God's promises to Abraham. And if they did the math, they knew the 400 years of slavery were about to end. And again, this is not part of the inspired word of God. Josephus tells us Amran was told in a dream that their child would be the deliverer of Israel. So somehow, some way, these godly parents knew, were told, it was revealed to them, Moses was beautiful in the sight of God. He had a role to play in the salvation of God's people. Now think of everything that was at stake. The nation of Israel rested upon this child being hid from the Egyptians. And humanly speaking, without Moses, there would be no Exodus and no Israel. No Ten Commandments, no tabernacle, no sacrifice, no promised land, no Joshua, no Rahab, no Samuel, no Ruth, no Jesse, no David, Even the birth of the child in Bethlehem is tied to Moses. What a lot of things, humanly speaking, were at stake. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw the child was beautiful. So point three, by faith. By faith, they hid him for three months. Now think about that. 
You should be amazed. And me too. How do you hide a baby from soldiers looking for a baby? Have you ever tried to hide a baby? We can read stories about the Nazis looking for Jews. And the Jews would be hiding in a house. And you would have to put your hand over the baby's mouth and nose and sometimes even kill your child to protect the rest of the family. How do you hide a baby? And let's start off with the pregnancy. How does Jacobit hide her pregnancy? Does she spend all of the last six months indoors? Does she always wear kind of a sack-like clothing? Does Amran do all the grocery shopping and, collect, and get the water and the firewood? And how does he explain his wife's absence at worship services and get-togethers? And after the baby is born, how do you hide a baby's wail? Every whimper, every cry, every wail must have sent a bolt of fear through the entire family. How do you keep a baby quiet? Quick, give him a bottle. Check his diaper. Give him a pacifier. Shut the door. Don't ever open that window. And then I thought, well, what about the smell? <laughs> How do you explain the diapers? How do you prepare the baby food in secret? And what about visitors? You know, people want to come over. Neighbors, family, friends. And what about the other two kids in the home? Aaron and Miriam. How do you keep them from spilling the beans on the playground or when you go shopping? And I say that from personal experience. We were expecting our second child. We had not told anyone yet. No, our third child, and we had not told anyone yet. And our second child spilled the beans at Sunday school class. <laughs> and so all the kids, understanding that, went and told their parents. And the Sunday school teacher asked us about it. OK, yeah, we're expecting. Everyone knows. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents. This may not seem like a long time, but I can tell you that must have been the most horrible three months of their entire life. How much sleep do you think they got? How did they respond every time there was an unexpected knock at the door? Now think of the message being given to the Hebrew Christians. They too were under the threat of persecution and the sword. And would they obey God or would they obey man? Would they submit to heavenly authority or earthly authority? Amran and Jochebed must have been a source of great encouragement to the Hebrew Christians to live by faith. Regardless of the world's threats. And isn't the message meant for us as well? We live in a godless world. We live in a godless culture that hates Christ and the gospel and the laws of God and the justice of God, even the idea of God. And we too are being called upon to live by faith and to submit to heavenly authority rather than earthly authority. And that brings us to our fourth point. Notice how our text ends. They were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, they had Moses for three months in response to God's word, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now let's make sure we understand that correctly. In what way were they not afraid? Our text is actually looking forward, speaking about our eternal security in Christ, our confidence in God and his promises. The body may be killed, but they knew they were eternally safe in the arms of Jesus. 
though they didn't know about Jesus yet. Now, this does not mean they felt no anxiety. This does not mean they were not under stress. This does not mean there was no knot in the bottom of their stomach. This does not mean that they were not physically scared. Of course they were. But they knew where they were going. They knew who held them for eternity. This means they did not allow their fears to determine their behavior. What controls them is faith. Faith that responds to God and his promises and his comfort and his care. Now the story of Amran and Jochebed is are supposed to remind us of another godly couple. I'm talking about Joseph and Mary. In the life of their baby, the Lord Jesus Christ was also threatened by a king who tried to kill all the baby boys. And they too were told that their baby had a place, a special place in God's redemption plan. Give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And so by faith, acting on the basis of faith, they also protected their baby from the soldiers of the king. Joseph and Mary were like Amram and Jochebed. They responded to God's word. They saved and protected the one who fulfilled everything Moses foreshadowed. They saved and protected the one who was greater, far, far greater than Moses, the one who is the King of kings and Lord of lords and the Savior of the world. Okay, we've been talking about the parents of Moses. We've been looking at the parents of Jesus, but now let me ask about you. Does our text describe you. Do you have the kind of faith that submits to heavenly authority when it conflicts with earthly authority? Now before this can happen, you need to do something. You need to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You need to believe he alone is your deliverer from sin and slavery and death. You need to bow before him as the supreme authority in life and death. And when that happens, then you too will be listed as one of the heroes of faith like Amram and Jochebed and hopefully You'll remember their names next time I ask. <laughs> Let us pray.